Do you smell what the rock is cooking? Well, I do. I'm in the Devil's Kitchen here in Lassa National Park, one of the best examples of fumaroles that you can find in the West Coast. Right behind me, we have some active fumarole vents that are espousing a bunch of steam and precipitated sulfur. So let's talk a little more about that. May 1915. All is quiet in the small mining and farming towns near Lassen Peak, when all of a sudden, the mountain awakens. The first U.S. volcanic eruption of the 20th century had just occurred. What followed was a series of eruptive activity lasting five to six years, with one of the eruptions being forceful enough to spew a violent cloud of ash 40,000 feet into the air that same 1915 May. What is this powerful volcano doing here? Well, the answer lies in plate tectonics. The Earth is split into plates invisible to the naked eye, driven by deep flowing currents in the inner molten part of the Earth called the mantle. The plates can be driven into, alongside, or away from one another, which produces the majority of stunning geologic features on Earth. In Lassen's case, it is the southernmost volcano in the Cascade Volcanic Range in North America's Pacific Northwest. This volcanic string of mountains was forged from the rising magma and abrasive forces caused by the sinking and melting of the Juan de Fuca Plate under North America. While this interaction started happening around 20 to 30 million years ago, the melted plate still is subducting, fueling volcanism in the region today. And in Lassen Volcanic Complex's case, it's been fueling it for 825,000 years. So as you can see right behind me, I have this really impressive geologic stunning mountain, and that is known as Brokoff Mountain. And it is actually where the volcanic center for Lassen Volcanic National Park used to be long before it was a national park. You see, Lassen Peak used to be part of a much larger volcano known as Mount Tahama, but around 400,000 years ago, Mount Tahama exploded and collapsed in a series of eruptions and landslides. Since then, the main volcanic vent, which relieves the underlying pressure of the pulled up magma underneath the region, has steadily been migrating north. And you can see it migrates. You see these other little plugs that are coming up here. It just represents that volcanic center migrating as it's going further north. So right behind me is Lassen Peak, the kind of gemstone of Lassen Volcanic National Park. It's where it gets its namesake. This is a very good example of a lava dome, which is a specific type of volcano, which I will talk about right now. Let's talk about magma and rock types to explain why Lassen Peak looks the way that it does. Over the course of its life, Lassen has been a hybrid mix of more dark rock and gentle mafic volcanism and lighter rock, higher energy felsic volcanism. In fact, in the 1950 eruptions, these both could be seen in a single eruption, with dark andesite erupting alongside lighter dacite, implying that the two are mixing in mass in the pool of magma known as the magma chamber, which is fed from the melting Juan de Fuca plate. But why does it have that iconic dome egg shape? During less intense eruptions thousands of years ago, only slightly melted, very thick magma began oozing out of Lassen's volcanic vent, which globbed up and began forming its iconic egg shape. There is also an only 400-year-old cinder cone in the park, which formed from an arch strombolian eruption of dark mafic basaltic rock, further representing the complexity of the magma in this volcanic center. So just kind of a fun fact, if you look up there, that eyeball shape that you see is called the Vulcan's Eye, and it is named after the Roman god of volcanoes, Vulcan. Now let's discuss the hydrothermal features of Lassen. So behind me here, you're probably wondering, why is it so yellow and colorful? Well, that is a threefold process. So behind me is a lot of precipitated sulfur. That's what that yellow color is. How did it precipitate out? Well, when water is superheated and it's rising through the Earth's crust on its way out here to become a fumarole, 
it is able to dissolve sulfur a lot more easily. Have you ever noticed that when you're making your morning coffee, when it's really hot, sugar easily dissolves in it? Try that same process in a cold glass of lemonade. It will not work as well. So that sulfur rises up, and then when it reaches the surface with the superheated water, the water cools down as it expands into the atmosphere as steam. And this allows the sulfur to precipitate out of the supersaturated solution, leaving behind these yellow remnants. So you're probably noticing the red and the purple and also that clay bubbling behind me as well. So that clay bubbling is sort of the same process as the precipitated sulfur. As that superheated water rises, it goes through a lot of thick sediment and picks it up. And that all comes out in a viscous, muddy fluid that's bubbling because of how hot it is. And the red and the purple are from iron and manganese chromophores that are deep within the rock. Now, a chromophore is simply any trace mineral like iron or manganese that I just mentioned that can fundamentally change the color of an entire rock. When iron and manganese are oxidized at really fast rates from the superheated water that's around them, those colors show up a lot more easily. So some other ways that a hydrothermal vent can get some color is by thermophiles. Grand Prismatic Spring in Yellowstone is a great example of that. Thermophiles are a type of bacteria that thrives around these hydrothermal vents, and they can emit a lot of really cool colors. Now, the main question on your mind is probably, why is this water superheated, and why is it rising out of the earth? Well, I'm going to talk about that right now. Why is this water so hot, and why is it coming out so aggressively? Well, you have to remember that we are in a volcano right now. And since we're on a volcano, there is a large magma chamber beneath us. A magma chamber is essentially just a big pool of molten rock that sits below a volcano and supplies it all of its lovely juice for eruptions, etc., etc. So when you have brown water that seeps into the ground in this area, it's going to get superheated by that same magma chamber that fuels eruptions. And this is going to cause that water to expand as it gets hot and want to flash the steam. So it's going to make its way to the surface where it can do that, creating these magnificent fumaroles that you see before me. Right now, I'm in literal hell. And by that, I mean bum pass hell, the biggest hydrothermal area here at Lassen Volcanic National Park. You see before me a huge field of lots of lovely fumaroles and sulfur creeks. And this happens to be my favorite place in the entire park, as well as many others. This is the most visited attraction here in the park, and for good reason. I mean, look at this absolutely stunning, amazing geologic feature. I just want to take a moment to show how truly loud some of these fumaroles can be, especially in Bump House Hell, so check this out. We are at another one of the five hydrothermal features here at Lassen Volcanic National Park. Right behind me is Boiling Lake, fed by Boiling Springs that you can see over there. This is a great example of some bathwater you do not want to swim in. This is some highly acidic and very hot water that's fed by that fumarole that is right over there. This lake is acidic for the same reason that it's precipitating all that sulfur that I talked about earlier. Very, very acidic volcanic gases can dissolve inside of this water and sit inside of this water in the form of this big old nasty looking lake here. We're here at the terminal geyser. It's not an actual geyser as it is not a pressurized flow of superheated water that explodes at regular intervals. This is simply one of those fumaroles I was talking about earlier with a cold creek going over it, which makes the steam quite impressive. This is another one of the five hydrothermal features here at Lassen Volcanic National Park. And that concludes our journey at Lassen National Park. This is the last of the hydrothermal features. Yes, I went to all five. I am very happy about that. This is a great example of a mud pot. It's when a fumarole is coming up at not that high of a temperature because it's interacting with colder groundwater before it reaches the surface and it allows it to uh, kind of pick up a lot more mud and dirt and thus you get this very lovely swampy color. So thank you very much for watching. Please leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed the content. I got plenty more coming on the way.